ತವಕಥಾಮೃತ ತಪ್ತ ಜೀವನ ಕವಿಭಿರೀಡಿತ ಕಲ್ಮಶಾಪಹಂ ಶರವಣಮಂಗಳ ಶ್ರೀಮತಾತ ಭುವಿ ಗುಣಂತಿ ಭುರಿರಾಚನ ತವಕಥಾಮೃತ ಯುರ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಲೈಕ್ ನೆಕ್ಟರ್ ತಪ್ತ ಜೀವನ ದೇ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಟು ಸ್ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಸೋಲ್ಸ್ ಕವಿಭಿರೀಡಿತ ದೇ ಪ್ರೇಸ್ ಬೈ poets praised by the wise kalma shapaham they put an end to all sin shravana mangalam simply hearing them is something very auspicious shrimad atadam they're wonderful and exalted bhuvi gananthiye bhuridajana those who spread these teachings these words are the most generous people in the world so i can consider myself now a generous person <laughs> Okay, last time we stopped on Sunday, April 9th, 1882. Those who were following in the book, this is page 96. And uh, I'll read the last paragraph that we read uh, just for the continuity. Because the devotee asked the question, what is the good of holy company? It's a good question. We take it for granted. Uh, and and Sri Ramakrishna tells us so many times throughout the gospel uh this is this is the number one instruction that he gives he gives a, it says so many things solitude and prayer and meditation and everything but uh i think holy company will be the number one on the list the majority vast majority of times so the question is what is the instrumentality of it what exactly is the process what how does it work we know it's nice to have holy company but uh, what is the uh actual function of it how how does it create this this uh, uh change in in our understanding and attitude so it's a very very nice question to to ask what is the good of holy company master it begets yearning for god now we've seen this in bakulata this yearning for god for sri ramakrishna is the most important factor so we have two things now we have the most important factor for god realization and the most important factor for acquiring that other factor huh? so it's a very simple formula that he says if we want god realization we have to have intense yearning for god if we want to have intense yearning for god we need holy company so it's very simple but getting holy company going from holy company to uh intense yearning for god uh, there's a big gap there so this getting holy company we'll see has to inspire us to do spiritual practice and it has to inspire us to change uh uh the, the or priorities and the way we live and all sorts of things in order to reach that second but this is the this is the cause and effect here this is the instrumentality of all of this holy company and then intense longing for god and then god realization so it begets yearning for god it begets love for god vyakulata and anuraga these are two terms that we see over and over again this anuraga is an intense ecstatic love for god nothing whatsoever is achieved in spiritual life without yearning be constantly living in the company of holy men oh sorry by constantly living in the company of holy men the soul becomes restless for god this bakulata intense longing for god and restlessness for, for god these are all, all part of the same package this yearning is like the state of a man who becomes ill sorry who has some an ill in the family his mind is in a state of perpetual restlessness thinking how the sick person may be cured or again one should feel a yearning for god like the yearning of a man who has lost his job and is wandering from one office to another in search of work if he is rejected at a certain place which has no vacancy he goes there again the next day and inquires is there any vacancy today so this is what we we finished with uh, on our last meeting and then he he continues so this is sri ramakrishna speaking there is another way So whenever he tells us holy company that'll be first of a list there's always a list and uh, as i say solitude very often follows but here he'll say prayer 
So there's another way, earnestly praying to God. God is our very own. We should say to him, O God, what is thy, real, what is thy nature? Reveal thyself to me. Thou must show thyself to me. For why else hast thou created me? Some Sikh devotees once said to me, God is full of compassion. Doyamai. This is a term that uh, they used to use. I don't know if it's common to the Sikh dharma or not, but the, there was a group of, of Sikh devotees, that uh, a couple of groups, that were very, very fond of Sri Ramakrishna. I, I spoke on this one time. It's a very beautiful story. Uh, many of them were soldiers who were stationed in, in Calcutta, and uh, just north of the, of the Dakshineshwar compound, Kali Temple compound, was what they called a magazine. The magazine was a place for, where they stored ammunition. So there were soldiers there, and uh, so many of them belonged to the Sikh Dharma, Sikh religion, and uh, they became very, very fond of Sri Ramakrishna. There was another group in uh, Barakpur, I believe, and they also used to come to visit him. There was one Kaur Singh, who Thakur mentions many times. They had tremendous devotion for Sri Ramakrishna. There was one case, instance, where uh, a whole platoon, a whole battalion, whatever, was, was marching down the road, and they happened to see Sri Ramakrishna there, and they all stopped and they bowed down and made pranam to him from a distance. And the officer uh, was, was furious. How could they do that? They're supposed to be marching and everything. But he was warned, don't do anything. Let, let them show their devotion, they may revolt. So they had this tremendous uh, love for Sri Ramakrishna, and he loved them also. Uh, but uh, when they would use this term, uh, dayamaya, then Sri Ramakrishna, he would, he would have this reaction. He would say, uh, I said, but why should we call him compassionate? Now, it sounds like a strange statement. And uh, to be honest, uh, if we read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, or many people who read it, they come away with a little bit of an impression that this idea of, of compassion was somehow secondary that it wasn't so important to Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, it's a very wrong conception. I think, what, and we'll see, what Thakur is saying here is that compassion, it's not that it's not necessary, we need something far greater, that this is, this is not a high enough standard. In fact, he used to say, this is the minimum standard for being a human being. He said, jar doya nei, tar manus hoi manus noi. Those who have no compassion, they may appear to be a human being. They may have taken a human body. They're not to be considered even as human beings. So it's minimal. Unless one has compassion, one is, is like a uh, subhuman somehow. So uh, we'll, we'll see why he's objecting to this. He said, I said, but why should we call him compassionate? He is our creator. What is there to be wondered at if he is kind to us? Parents bring up their children. Do, they, do you call that an act of kindness? Yeah, the mother uh, changes the diaper of the baby. You say, oh, how kind the mother was, how compassionate. Such compassionate to, uh, compassionate to, to do that. No, it's her own child. This, uh, who else will do it? It's, it's uh, uh, nothing to be thought of as anything great. This is Takwa's idea. Parents bring up their children. Do you call that an act of kindness? They must act that way. Therefore, we should force our demands on God. He is our father and mother, isn't he? If the son demands his patrimony and gives up food and drink in order to enforce his demand, then the parents hand his share over to him three years before the legal time. Or when the child demands some pice from his mother and says over and over again, Mother, give me a couple of pice. I beg you on my knees. Then the mother, seeing his earnestness and unable to bear it anymore, tosses the money to him. So, Takur, what he's trying to say is, if we look upon God as compassionate, then we're not feeling that God is our very own father and mother. That we should feel such an intimate relationship that uh, we can force our demands on God. So, I, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity just to talk a little bit about uh, what Takur, how he uses this term, daya, daya, compassion because he'll use it in, in, in different ways. The, uh, 
He'll, he'll make a distinction on the one hand between Maya and Daya. We'll, we'll see this several times in the Gospel. That Maya uh, means this love and, and, and fellow feeling and even compassion, but something with the attachment and everything to those who are very near and dear to us. And it extends out. So we can say this Maya will be mostly for our family members, but then it'll also be for uh, our close friends. Then it'll extend a little further, those who belong to our community, and then those who belong to our country, and then those, those who belong to our religion. It'll keep extending out and getting watered down a little bit, but it's always based on the idea of us and them. It's always based on this idea of those who belong to this circle, however big it is, and those who are outside of it. So Takwa gives different e examples. We can, even we know in our own lives, that suppose we, we read in the paper that there's an earthquake somewhere, or somebody tells us, did you hear about the earthquake? And we say, no, what happened? And so many, uh, tens of thousands of people died. We say, ah, what a horrible thing. Where was it? And then somebody says, oh, I am not sure, somewhere in Asia. We say, Asia? Oh, really? Uh, was it in India? They say, yes, it was in India. And then we, now we think, oh, really, it's a horrible thing. Where in India? It was somewhere in West Bengal. Ah, West Bengal where in West Bengal? Then he says, I think it was actually affected all of, of Kolkata. They said, Kolkata? My whole family is from there. And then... Uh, the talker gives the example that somebody's sweeping the courtyard and somebody says, did you hear that so-and-so was sick and died? He said, ah, too bad. And then he said, who was it? And he hears the name. And it's a close friend or relative. And he says, immediately the broom falls from his hand and he falls down unconscious. So this is a very natural thing that we identify more closely, of course, with family members, but uh, it extends outward. Uh, and, as I say, becomes less and less and less. But it always requires something different, some, 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 uh, someone we consider to be a stranger. I remember uh, a story that they used to tell about uh, Russian astronaut and an American astronaut. And uh, they're terrible rivals. They were trying to get to the moon, one before the other, and, and they really just look upon each other as, as the enemies and everything. They, they both get to the moon at the same time, <coughs> and they're there, and they're, they're quarreling over who's going to uh, put the flag down first and who's going to be able to claim this land or that land. Then all of a sudden, they see the Martians coming. So what do they do? Hand in hand, they say, come, brother, let's run. So <laughs> as, as soon as there's somebody who's, who's more different, someone who's more uh, of a stranger to us, then we feel close to the other people. This is Maya. So Takwar says, it's not a terribly bad thing, but it's restricted and limited, and it's based on ignorance. Ignorance because uh, we should feel this oneness with everyone, the same self within all beings. So he says this maya has to be extended, if that, that same feeling that we have towards our very near and dear ones, if that can be extended to all living beings, then this is the highest ideal, compassion, real compassion, daya. Okay, so this is, this is when he uses the term, when he uses it in, in distinction to the term maya, then he's, he's using it as a very high ideal. Now, there's a, another incident that took place where we see that Sri Ramakrishna will talk about this adaya as a very low ideal. It's a very, very well-known incident, and it uh, played a tremendous role in forming and shaping the uh, ideas of Swami Vivekananda. Uh, one day, Sri Ramakrishna was talking about uh, some of the teachings of Chaitanya Deva. There's a, a long section in the Chaitanya Charitamrita where he's talking to Ramananda or Swarup, somebody. Anyhow, I don't remember the, the details, but uh, he's giving all of his uh, teachings or is getting it from some, anyhow, I don't remember, but they keep saying, no, this is, make it a little, a little more, more subtle. So he goes, he breaks it down into five teachings, then three teachings. Eventually it'll go to one. But the three teachings are uh, that one must have, Namiruchi, uh, a taste for the name of God, then Vaishnava Seva, 
then uh, service to devotees of God, and then Jivedaya. So this is the term Jivedaya. So Sri Ramakrishna is talking about this and compassion to living beings. And he's repeating it to himself. Jivedaya, Jivedaya, Jivedaya. And he goes into this, this mood of his. He goes into some type of ecstatic mood. And in, in that mood, he says, what is this? Who, who are you living creatures like worms crawling on the earth? Who do you do to claim that you can show compassion to living beings? He said, no, it's not compassion. It has to be love and it has to be a feeling of, of service to others. We have to feel the privilege to do it. The, this was uh, such, it left such a deep impression on Narendra that day that when he left, he said to, to the, his friends, he said, did you hear what Takwa said? And they said, no, what did he say? <laughs> they all heard it. He said, you didn't, you didn't notice what he said. He said, this is one of the greatest teachings that I've ever heard. This, this uh, taking the highest teaching of Advaita Vedanta, the, seeing the self dwelling in all beings, and putting this in such practical terms uh, so that we can do this as a type of worship. He said, if, if the Divine Mother ever gives me an opportunity, I'll spread this teaching throughout the world. And he did. So what do we have here? That we, Maya, okay, Maya is not so terrible, but very restricted and limited. That it gets expanded into Daya, into this compassion. Now this compassion has to be raised because if we feel compassion towards someone else, it means we feel a difference, we feel a distinction. We probably feel we're better, that we're able to show some compassion to them, these poor creatures, like that. So that has to be raised to something which we can call seva. So this feeling of, no, God dwells within all beings, so if I help anyone, it's service to living beings. So it goes from maya to daya to seva, and then he get raised to what? Puja. And then we have to look upon it as a worship. So this is with Swamiji's great uh, message to the mankind that service to living beings is the highest type of worship of God. So now we see that this compassion, it's okay, but it's based on this idea of distinction, based on this idea uh, that uh, we're doing something praiseworthy. So Swamiji said no, that it has to be with tremendous humility and even gratitude that we have that opportunity to uh, take this uh, service to living beings as, and make it part of our worship, to look upon the human beings as uh, the highest manifestation of God in human form. And of course, he, he made one special distinction that uh, this worship of, of Dharidra Narayana, that special manifestation of God in the poor, in the downtrodden, in the exploited, in the underprivileged, uh, disenfranchised people, that for him, uh, service to them was the highest type of worship. And he said so many times he'd be happy to be born over and over and over again in order to be able to worship God dwelling within this Daridra, within the poor. So, uh, this was all because of the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. So uh, if we ever wonder uh, what was his real feeling about this idea of compassion, we see his real feeling was that uh, it has to be raised to this feeling of love for all beings, this feeling of oneness, this feeling of seeing the divine within others, uh, seeing it as a, as a type of privilege, and serving others as a worship of God. Okay, now, uh, so we have, so far, what is the good of holy company? We find that it begets yearning for God, and one of the ways that it does that uh, is if this holy company will inspire us to prayer. So that was the second thing, earnestly praying to God. Now we'll get another benefit. He says there's another, ben another benefit from holy company. It helps one cultivate discrimination between the real and the unreal. Okay, now this is another big issue. We saw at the very uh, uh, first uh, real conversation that M had with Sri Ramakrishna, their second visit, that Sri Ramakrishna met, mentioned this also, this 
Sat, Asat, Vichara. This, uh, how do we uh, distinguish between Sat? Sat is real, Asat is unreal. These are very vague terms. They can be understood in so many different ways. The very traditional Advaita Vedantic way will be from a metaphysical point of view that uh, uh, real means that uh, unchanging infinite absolute reality of Brahman. Unreal means this transitory universe or this universe of appearance which is, has no real existence uh, separate from Brahman. So this, this snake that we see is, is completely unreal but the rope underlying it is, is the reality. So it, we see it used in different senses. Katupanishad, we see this sad, asad vichara, not using those terms, but as a discrimination between what is important in life and what is not important in life. What is shreyas, what is of ultimate value to us, what can raise us higher, what can uh, take us to some type of, of spiritual uh, realization, and prayas, which is not something terrible, but it's the pleasant, it's the pleasurable, it's, it's the quick fix, it's the thing that gets us uh, uh, the, the immediate gratification. It doesn't last long, and, and it doesn't really satisfy us. It's not a horrible thing. There's no, nothing so terrible about a little enjoyment here and now, but we have to understand that uh, it doesn't replace the shreyas. The shreyas is the, is the real thing. So we have different ways of looking at it. What Sri Ramakrishna liked best was this uh, uh, discrimination between the real and the transitory. He didn't go into this idea of is this world illusory or not illusory. He didn't care for that too much. He would mention it only as, uh, oh, this is the attitude of the jnanis. They'll take it this way. Uh, but he really, he really wanted us to look at this transitory nature, not just of the world, but of life itself. That this life is fleeting. That the next thing we know, it's gone. We look back, where did the years go? That it goes just, uh, uh, he says, in two days, dudin. This is you fig figuratively, of course. But So he says, uh, God alone is the real, that is to say, the eternal substance. And the world is unreal. So we'll see, almost always, when he says unreal, he'll add, that is to say, transitory. Anitya. This is the term that he likes. He uses mostly. Uh, sometimes he'll say, avastu. This vastu, bostu, uh, it means that there's no substance to it. It's hollow. The world is hollow. The pleasures and joys of, of the world, really worldly types of things, uh, they leave us feeling empty sometimes. So this is that type of discrimination that he really wanted. As soon as a man finds his mind wandering away to the unreal, so that doesn't mean to this idea that this, uh, uh, what, what I'm taking to be real is really an illusion. It means the mind is wandering away to, uh, to just uh, petty types of enjoyment. He should apply discrimination. The moment an elephant stretches out its trunk to eat a plantain tree in a neighbor's garden, it gets a blow from the iron goad of the driver. So this is uh, one of the ways that we understand what's called abhyasa, abhyasa yoga, that uh, the elephant gets trained that way. And we have to take this goad and use it on the mind itself. We sit for meditation, the mind goes to worldly things, or starts to fall asleep. Then we take this goad and we hit it. We hit ourselves on the head so that we, we don't fall asleep and the mind doesn't wander to worldly things. So this is a type of abhyasa of practice. And unless we do it, we, we don't overcome these tendencies of the mind. Mind has two tendencies, really, when we, when we sit for meditation. Either it's, it's overactive, it runs all over the place, or it goes to sleep. And uh, these are the two main obstacles in, in meditation. And really, we just have to take this goad. You know what a goad is? It has the very sharp end to it. They, they, they'll make, the elephant will bleed even, huh? When they, they hit it with that. Yeah, just uh, so that the mind will, will start to obey us. 
So the moment an elephant stretches out its trunk to eat a plantain tree in a neighbor's garden, it gets a blow from the iron goad of the driver, a neighbor. Now, these, these neighbors, we don't know who these people are right now. This was, uh, uh, he's at the, the home of Colonel Vishwanath, that's captain. He used to call him captain. And a number of his friends came and Pran Krishna also. So a neighbor. Why does a man have sinful tendencies? Okay, now this is a question that Arjuna asked Sri Krishna and Gita also. It's a very good question. We wonder why the mind wants to do things that uh, we may even know we shouldn't do. We may not even want to do it. One of the verses that I find most interesting in the Gita, the entire Gita, uh, it's, it's such a uh, uh, curious but yet insightful question when Arjuna asked Sri Krishna, why do we do things that we don't want to do? Why do we, why do we commit sinful acts when we really don't want to do it, as if we're being pushed to do it. He says, anichan, we're, we have no desire to do it. And he said, balad eva, as if by force, as if this outside person is saying, no, you have to do this. Said, but I don't want to do it. No, you have to do it. But I know that it's wrong to do it. You have to. This is, uh, sometimes we talk about uh, the devil within. The devil made me do it. Huh? I didn't really want to do it, but yeah, some inner voice said, it's okay. You can, you can steal the cookies from the cookie jar. You do, we won't tell your mother. You can get away with it. It's okay. So he's asking, why does a man have sinful tendencies? So we can easily understand this uh, with somebody who just likes to do uh, all sorts of things and doesn't think twice about it. But it's a really insightful question for somebody who doesn't want to do these things, who wants to lead a very pure, good, holy type of life, and yet finds the mind still has these old tendencies there. Now, we'll see that when Sri Ramakrishna gives answers, we'll find he gives different answers at different times for different people, and I very often don't take these answers to be, uh, or don't take them in a very literal sense, because uh, Sri Ramakrishna always inspired his uh, devotees and disciples to adopt a particular attitude. This was, this was more important to him. He didn't deal with this idea that this is the only explanation, this is the ultimate truth. For him, truth was nothing but experience. Everything else was an attitude which was more or less helpful and which more or less uh, would jibe with the, the ultimate truth. Not that he gave equal... Uh, importance to every possible attitude. There, there are some that are not helpful, but uh, we'll see. Sometimes he'll give these answers and uh, we can take them uh, literally if we want, or we can take them as, oh, this is a very beautiful attitude to have. And uh, to me, this is very important that very often we can have a spiritual attitude and at the same time, if somebody says, do you really believe that? We can say, ah, don't ask me that question. Huh? So uh, I say that, look, I've, I've, uh, my attitude is that whatever happens is for my, my benefit because the Divine Mother won't do anything that's not for, for the best, whatever happens. And somebody says, oh, even when the terrible things happen and murders and this and that and everything, I say, well, don't ask me too many questions. This is an attitude that I like. It works for me. I'm not going to say it's good for everybody, for anybody else. I'm not going to say it's verifiable, uh, but it's very, very helpful for me in my spiritual life. And I, and I follow that with a certain type of firm conviction that I know it's beneficial and helpful. And on some level, it's true. If you ask me about all the details of it, I won't be able to give any good answers. So don't bother me with that. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Sometimes we get answers like that. So Sri Ramakrishna will say, in God's creation, there are all sorts of things. Okay, we can all accept that. He has created bad men as well as good men. Now, what does that mean? That uh, he, in the beginning, he decides we'll have 50% good, 50% bad. I take this as meaning that this is the nature of things. The universe that is projected out of that infinite Brahman, has, it has certain rules that it follows. It works in a certain way that there'll be good and bad, there'll be ups and downs, dwandwas, there'll be hot and cold. This is just the nature of things. 
And uh, not that God decided exactly to do it this way, but this is, this is the, the nature of things. I take it that way. Uh, even in the Upanishads, we have to be very careful not to take things too literally. Did Brahman really sit down one day and say, Bahusyam, may I be many? Did he really look around and get bored and say, I'd like a little company? May I be many? These are a little bit allegorical. So anyhow, there will be people who will say, no, whatever Takwa says is literally true. God bless them. I have no quarrel with them. To have that type of faith is a wonderful thing. Uh, I think too much, so I analyze things this way. So he says, uh, he has created bad men as well as good men. It is he who gives us good tendencies, and it is he again who gives us evil tendencies. Now, what does this mean? We blame God. Okay, so I have this tendency every once in a while, uh, I, I don't tell the truth. So they say, why don't you tell the truth? Well, God gave me that tendency. Huh? Can I say that? Ah, I can say it, but what, what exactly does it mean? When I know that this is, I should take responsibility for these things. So the neighbor is going to follow up. He says, in that case, we aren't responsible for our sinful actions, are we? And now, very good, so we're free. That everything is mother's will, I do as she makes me do, that means I can do whatever I want. So what will Takwa say? Now we'll see, he's going, to, uh, he's going to clarify things a little bit. Okay, everything is God's will. That means God's will was that we have the law of karma. Huh? The law of karma means cause and effect. It means that uh, uh, you, you have to take responsibility. So we'll see, it's, he's, going to get, he's going to refine this a little bit. Master, sin begets his own result. That is God's law. So now from God's will to God's law. Huh? A little slightly, we're, we're, uh, we're seeing that uh, the first answer was a, a very nice answer. And if we're very simple uh, and trusting people, we can just take that in and leave it. But now the neighbor is pushing him, so he's going to refine it a little bit. Won't you burn your tongue if you chew a chili? So that means if you commit sinful acts, won't you develop that sinful tendency? Won't that result come and won't you suffer for it? In his youth, Mathur, this is Mathur, Babu Mat, this was, uh, of course, uh, Rani, Rani Rashmani's uh, son-in-law son who ran everything and who was the, the, the main uh, supporter of, of Sri Ramakrishna and, and loved Sri Ramakrishna, uh, but he led a very fast type of life. He wasn't a, a, such a saintly person all of the time, regardless of his tremendous faith in Sri Ramakrishna. In his youth, Mathur led a rather fast life, so he suffered from various diseases before his death. So now, he's not blaming God for any of this. He's blaming Mathur himself, that uh, he did many things, probably had some people killed, even. Yeah, we know that Tucker actually had to save him one time. Uh, these people who were landlords and everything, uh, they could be a little ruthless. Maybe not on purpose, but they would always have gundas, these ruffians, to take care of things. And so now we see that uh, the law of karma is also there. How do we, how do we uh, put together these two? Everything is God's will and, and everything is the result of our own karma. Two slightly different ways of looking at things. That's all. If we want to say, if we want to really try to harmonize them, we say, well, God's will is that uh, uh, this law of karma is in, is in effect. One may not realize this in youth. I've looked into the hearth in the kitchen of the Kali temple when logs are being burnt. At first, Thakur was very, very observant. There's the simplest little things he, he would see, and he would come up with these, these brilliant examples. At first, the wet wood burns rather well. It doesn't seem, then, that it contains much moisture. But when the wood is sufficiently burnt, all the moisture runs back to one end. At last, water squirts from the fuel and puts out the fire. So what does this mean? It means if we have some karma there, well, we, it may not come out right away. We, we may uh, look like, oh, we, we were saved, we were spared from it. 
that uh, somehow we don't have to experience the fruits of these bad actions in the past, but eventually it'll come out. Eventually it'll come out and uh, uh, there's, there's no way of getting around that unless we really uh, do some very intense spiritual practice and, and get some type of grace. Thakur is always, uh, as much as he talks about this, uh, we have to bear the fruits of our past action, he also talks about mitigating factor, those who have some type of God realization, a higher experience, they'll have to experience their prarabdha karma, but it'll be tremendously reduced. Holy Mother also uh, believed this very much. If because of what we did in the past, uh, we are destined in this lifetime to have a sword go through our chest. He said, this, we have some higher realization or something uh, that Prarabdha karma won't be erased, uh, erased completely, but we'll get a pinprick instead. So this was their way of honoring the doctrine, we can say. So one should be careful about anger, passion, and greed. So in the beginning, yes, why do we have sinful tendencies? In the beginning, he said, that God's creation, there are all sorts of things. Now he's telling us, you take a little responsibility for that because you'll suffer from it. So he says, one should be careful about anger, passion, and greed. Take, for instance, the case of Hanuman. In a fit of anger, he burned Ceylon. At last, he remembered that Sita was living in the Ashoka Grove. Then he began to tremble, lest the fire should injure her. Neighbor, why has God created wicked people? So now he's back to that first idea. Now that uh, God is responsible for everything. First thing was, uh, why do we have sinful tendencies? And now why has he, he created wicked people? Master, that is his will, his play. Now, this is the Leela doctrine. And again, I want to stress this idea that uh, there are so many different ways that we have of, or attitudes that we have. I don't even want to say explanations for things, different attitudes that we can take. This is one of them, that this is all the play of the divine. And if it's a play, uh, it doesn't have the same sting to us because we're all actors in it. And uh, this play will be over, we'll take off this costume and, and whatever happened before, it doesn't affect us anymore. So it takes the sting out of it. It's, it's a, and a nice way of looking at it that uh, eliminates the need for any real explanation. Why are things this way? It's the play of the Lord. It's Maya. We can also say that. It's a, a way of saying that uh, don't ask for any deeper explanation. Why did the author compose a play with all of these different things happening? In it? it was the sweet will of the author. He could have done it differently. So don't ask for anything more than that. So Takur, he liked this. Again, I, uh, this is an attitude. This term bhav, the Sri Krishna uses it all of the time. That uh, he says, uh, it doesn't matter which attitude we have, but we have to stick with it. There has to be something consistent about it. It doesn't mean we can't have different attitudes at different times, but they shouldn't conflict with each other. Different times, we, we may have different moods and see things in, in a different way. So it was never that this is true and this is false. It was always that this is a certain attitude to take. So this is one way, and perhaps he knows, he can see that for this neighbor, this will be most helpful. That is his will, his play, in his maya, there exists a vidya as well as vidya. Now, there's a little bit uh, of logic here that uh, there won't be darkness without light, there won't be heat without cold, we won't even have these concepts unless we have these others. So this dwandwa, these pairs of opposites seem to have some essential role in the nature of this relative reality that we live in. Darkness is needed too. It reveals all the more the glory of light. There is no doubt that anger, lust, and greed are evils. Why then has God created them? Well, another question. Do we want to blame God for these things? In order to create saints. Now, again, we can take it literally or we can say that, okay, I really don't know why God created people like this, but I do know that these people are saint makers. I know that for certain 
that there will be people that try our patients to such a degree that if we can manage to be patient with them, then we'll turn ourselves into real saints. This is, there's no doubt about that. We don't have to uh, come up with any divine plan behind any of this in order to, to realize that. That uh, we can look at everything that happens and every individual, every obstacle we face as an opportunity for us to learn patience and forbearance and compassion and love and to turn ourselves into saints. 100% true. A man becomes a saint by conquering the senses. So this is part of it, conquering the senses and uh, learning to deal with all types of people also. Is there anything impossible for a man who has subdued his passions? He can even realize God through his grace. Again, see how his whole play of creation is perpetuated through lust. Okay, we say lust. Takwar is always talking about uh, this con uh, uh, conquering lust and greed. This world won't go on without lust. It won't go on without greed. I, I often uh, call these things Darwinian samskaras. Huh? That if, uh, if even in the animal kingdom, if these things aren't there, species won't continue. So this is part of, of what it means to be a human being, to have all of these, these so-called passions are very natural to the human being. That doesn't mean that we don't try to transcend them. Swamiji says in one place that uh, all of life is, is this fight against to conquer nature, not the external nature so much, internal nature, to conquer these, these tendencies, lower tendencies that we all have, which are part of the fact that we belong to the animal kingdom. It's a part of, of life for that. So he says the whole pl play of creation is perpetuated through lust. Wicked people are needed too. We may wonder, <laughs> it would be nice if there were no wicked people, but in order for this play to go on, this, uh, otherwise the play will end. Everyone will have God realization, and it'll be gone. Takwa gives another example, which I also don't take too literally, but uh, in this, this game of, of uh, touch the granny, huh? everyone is blindfolded, and if they, and they grope around and, and there's one person who plays the role of the granny, if they happen to touch her, they can take their blindfold off and they're out of the game. So he says the, the granny will move a little bit. She doesn't want everybody to, to touch her right away. Otherwise, the whole game is over. You know, we play this, uh, what is it called? Musical chairs. Huh? That each time around, somebody loses. But uh, that person who's out of the game Oh, okay, they, uh, there's nothing for them to do. Now, if, uh, if we get out of this game, actually, we're the winner. We get out of that game, we're the loser. A little bit different, but anyhow, this is one way of looking at it. The play, in order for the play to continue, there have to be uh, people who are good, people who are bad, everything. At one time, the tenants of an estate became unruly. The landlord had to send Golak Chaudhuri, who was a ruffian. The gunda, I like this term gunda. Huh? These, these are uh, uh, goons we have, huh? these the gangsters. They also have their goons. They'll be these huge guys who go around. Anybody gets out of line, they'll get a good beating. So these gundas. He was such a harsh administrator that the tenants trembled at the very mention of his name. We're just talking about the variety of people now in the world. There is need of everything. One Sita said to her husband, Rama, it would be grand if every house in Ayodhya were a mansion. I find many houses old and dilapidated. But my dear, said Rama, if all the houses were beautiful ones, what would the masons do? All left. So left her. Yeah, we, we can look at it that way. There's a role for everyone in this universe. Uh, every animal has a role to play in creation. Uh, people from, uh, with all different skill sets, all different things. Even, even the thieves and the policemen, huh? they somehow work together. God has created all, created all kinds of things. He has created good trees and poisonous plants and weeds as well. Among the animals there are good, bad, and all kinds of creatures. Tigers, lions, snakes, and so on. Now, how do we understand all of this? We can say one thing is that don't question these things so much. This is the world we live in. We have to accept it. We have to learn to deal with it. 
we have to learn to navigate through it and we have to learn how to, to go beyond it. Now the neighbor will ask another good question. Sir, is it ever possible to realize God while leading the life of a householder? This was always a very big issue that, uh, come on, that uh, generally it was felt that unless one renounced the world, one could not have any type of, of higher realization or samadhi. This was uh, uh, not something that uh, didn't have any basis in, in, uh, in scripture and uh, teachings, orthodox teachings, Shankaracharya and others, even, even Swamiji at some point, you know, talking to the disciple, he says, yes, sannyasa is necessary. So, uh, fortunately, we have teachings of Gita, which say sannyasa is necessary, but it doesn't have to be formal. It can be within the, the uh, parameters of the householder's life. And Sri Ramakrishna always said the same thing, that it's internal renunciation. The Gita goes very, very far. Internal renunciation makes one a real sannyasi. External renunciation, if there's attachment, is a phony sannyasi. So uh, he's asking, so many people will ask that question. We're householders, is there any hope for us? So what does Sri Ramakrishna say? He says, certainly. So is, is it ever possible to realize God while leading the life of a householder? Certainly. But as I said just now, one must live in holy company and pray unceasingly. Leading a householder life and only having company of worldly people, uh, there's no hope. Then one just sinks further and further. There's no reason why the householder can have holy company. Now, how does one constantly have holy company? Nowadays, it's, it's, it's almost a, a, a simple thing. You turn on your computer, you can, you can see these uh, YouTube talks, huh? you can do all day long. You can open up your uh, Gospel of Sri Krishna, Gospel of Holy Mother, uh, teachings of Swamiji, all of these things, this is also holy company. It, it doesn't replace uh, actual uh, presence, being the actual presence of a holy person, but on some level, the uh, holy company we get from reading the gospel is, is the highest type of holy company, because no matter how great a sadhu is nowadays, uh, it, it won't be the same. As, as those who had the actual company of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. That was a completely different thing. So don't think that this isn't holy company. Don't think it isn't holy company to be in the company of devotees. It doesn't have to be uh, the monks and nuns or anything like that. There's those, those who are also on a spiritual path. They form their own family. This is a very nice idea Thakur talks about, that they become one's own family, one's own family sometimes become strangers, that we feel closer to the devotees, we feel closer to our guru bhais, guru bones, those who we've, we've fed, uh, uh, brother and sister uh, disciples, we have the same guru, we follow the same spiritual path, we have a bond with them that's incredibly close, and we feel uh, we, these, these are our very own people. And sometimes relatives, we think, ah, okay, we, we have that relationship and everything, but uh, there's a different level of attachment sometimes. So, but as I said just now, one must live in holy company and pray unceasingly. These were the two things we got today. We got also this idea of, of compassion, but these were the two teachings that he said, holy company and pray unceasingly. So that means be prayerful. Not every second we're saying, oh, oh Lord, reveal yourself, reveal. Not every second like that. Even japa should be done prayerfully. Everything we do should be, this is the main idea of karma yoga. Everything we, we do should be like a prayer. We, we do it as an, as an offering. Prayer doesn't mean seeking something always. It means we do it with that, that loving attitude. When the impurities of the mind, so, oh, so this is what happens one should weep for God, uh, when the impurities of the mind are thus washed away. So this prayer, all of the spiritual practices, this is to wash away these impurities of the mind. One realizes God. 
The mind is like a needle covered with mud, and God is like a magnet. The needle cannot be united with the magnet unless it is free from mud. Tears wash away the mud, which is nothing but lust, anger, greed, and other evil tendencies, and the inclination to worldly enjoyments as well. These are the shadripu, these six passions are the six enemies. And uh, uh, this, this tremendous longing for God, this weeping for God, this Taku used to say that this, this will do the job. He would say, weep continuously for God uh, for three straight days. Sometimes he would say 24 hours and you'll realize God. Of course, who can do that? If you tell somebody weep for God, they say, oh, that's very nice. How do I do it? Huh? It, it involves tremendous uh, spiritual practice and, and uh, yeah, this is, this is the funny thing. The sadhana seems to be a very boring, routine type of thing, but that's how we reach the stage of anuraga. As soon as the mud is washed away, the magnet attracts the needle. That is to say, man realizes God. Only the pure in heart see God. A fever patient has an excess of the watery element in his system. What can quinine do for him unless that is removed? Why shouldn't one realize God while living in the world? But, as I said, one must live in holy company, pray to God, weeping for his grace, and now and then go into solitude. Now the third one. Now we get this idea of solitude. Unless the plants on the footpath are protected at first by fences, they are destroyed by cattle. There's a positive thing and a negative thing. Positive thing is we get to intensify our spiritual practice. We get to feel uh, ourselves just as pure being, that no one is around to observe us, to look at us, to talk to us, anything like that. And from the negative point of view, we've removed ourselves from uh, all worldly circumstances, all things that trigger worldly desires and everything. So double reason for this, holy, for this solitude. Neighbor, then the householders too will have the vision of God, won't they? Master, everyone will surely be liberated. But one should follow the instructions of the Guru. If one follows a devious path, one will suffer in trying to retrace his steps. It takes a long time to achieve liberation. Now, Takur, he says it takes a long time, but it happens in a flash. Another paradoxical statement, but, but a beautiful statement. It takes a long time, but once we have that experience, then just it takes place in a flash. This idea of, of having a guide in spiritual life. Uh, two very important elements, many things, of course, we can talk about, but one is that we have faith in it, that uh, we'll follow it, we won't give it up if it's not uh, immediately successful. And the second thing is that we often don't know what's best for us. We think that we're choosing the, the best path for us, but we may not know, and it may lead us in the wrong direction. That's why he says we may have to retrace our steps even. A man may fail to obtain it, that means realization, in this life. Perhaps he will realize God only after many births. Sages like Janaka performed worldly duties. They performed them bearing God in their minds. So not just that they did everything in the world, but they were real, real seekers. As a dancing girl dances, keeping jars or trays on her head. Haven't you seen how the women in northwest India walk, talking and laughing while carrying water pitchers on their heads? They even can dance, huh? There's a type of dance, yeah, with a water pitcher on the head, and they won't, they, the head will remain still, everything else is moving. They won't spill a drop. This is that tremendous concentration. That means we can be concentrated on, on God. Takwar says that we really just need uh, a small percentage of the mind on our work, we can leave the rest on God. Neighbor, you just referred to the instructions of the Guru. How shall we find him? Master, anyone and everyone cannot be a Guru. A huge timber floats on the water and can carry animals as well, but a piece of worthless wood sinks if a man sits on it and drowns him. Therefore, in every age, God incarnates himself as the Guru to teach humanity. Satchidananda alone is the Guru. In our order, especially, you'll find that gurus of our order do not consider themselves gurus. 
they feel Sri Ramakrishna is the guru and that uh, his power is only working through them because they've been uh, given some special uh, privilege of giving initiation, but they won't have that, that feeling. And to say uh, Sri Ramakrishna is the real guru and to say Satchirananda, that uh, God himself is the guru, these are not two different things. What is knowledge and what is the nature of this ego? God alone is the doer and none else. This is knowledge. Okay, now uh, I'm going to stop here. You'll, you'll think it's very funny because there are just a few lines left before the end of the chapter, but it really raises a whole new, new topic. And uh, we'll stop with this next time, this idea of who is the real doer, who is the real agent of action. So that's the very bottom of page 98. We will do that next time. And I will close with the, with the chant. Om Niranjanam Nityamanandarupam Bhaktanukam Bhatur Vikraham Vahi Ishavataram Paramesham Hidyam Tam Ramakrishnam Shirasa Namama Okay, thank you everyone and we'll see you next time.